Welcome to the first lecture set for Geography GIS 25, Introduction to GIS and Laboratory. This is your professor, Jason Finley, or Dr. Jason Finley. And with these lectures, I want to give you guys much more in-depth uh, view into the concepts and theories behind geographic information systems. Now, before I talk about GIS, I often ask people if you've used some of these tools. In this example, we're using MapQuest. Maybe in the past you've used GPS devices, or probably you have used Google Earth. Well, if you used any of these types of uh, resources, you have used geospatial technology. Geospatial technology is a broader definition of anything that has geographic information. It includes global positioning systems, remote sensing, and this course, geographic information systems. Now, another way you may have used GIS and didn't even realize it is with your smartphone. Smartphones have GPS capability. And with mapping in the GIS, or sorry, in your uh, mobile phone, you can actually see maps and you can see yourself moving with the map. And again, that's just a very uh, loose, but uh, extremely common example of a GIS. This course though, you're gonna get more hands-on view of actually doing GIS behind the scenes. So what GIS does, and we're going to learn a little bit more about what it is as we go forward, is it uses various layers of data to include a lot of different uh, data sets in order to solve problems. For example, in this image, we see building footprints, transportation network, uh, elevation, and even topographic maps. If you align all of these data on top of each other, you can create a really robust map. And this map is actually live. It is dynamic. You can change it very easily in a GIS. Who uses geospatial technology? Uh, a lot of different industries out there Almost every kind of industry I can think of uses GIS. And the next slide will talk about more specific uh, industries. But overall, the employment and training admission, or sorry, administration estimates that $8.3 billion have been invested in geospatial technology within the last 10 years. So this is just a sample of who uses GIS, energy forecasting. When I used to work at the Southern California Edison uh, group in uh, Rosemead, we used GIS for uh, energy forecasting, mainly for uh, uh, weather forecasting to determine how much energy we need, and also for coastal management. There's, a, there's a public health, aviation, uh, disaster management, and the list goes on and on. So because geography is in the title, let's talk about geography for a second. Geography is the study of where things are on Earth. Geo basically means Earth, and you can think of graphy as description. Now, college-level geography often goes beyond where things are, and it looks at why things are where they are. So I put this definition up here, and geography basically deals with spatial characteristics of anything on our planet that could be physical or cultural. And here are some questions that we use, uh, or that GIS could be used to answer. And within the field of geography, GIS is really the most revolutionary part of geography. It's also where the jobs are. So in addition to this first question where it is, we might ask why it's there or why isn't it somewhere else? We could look at how much it's, um, how much of it is at one location and if it's found throughout the world. 
we can see how things have changed spatially or temporally. Is it spreading or being diffused? And what geographic factors could constrain a spread? So these are just a sample of questions that a GIS can much more easily answer compared to some of uh, you know, some other methods of spatial analysis, like uh, using uh, paper maps. Some more examples. Uh, 911 dispatchers often rely on GIS or remote sensing technology to help with emergencies. When we, when we get into sustainable agriculture, you might learn a little bit about that in cultural geography and, and a little bit in, in physical geography. We want to map out the best areas that provide um, you know, the type of uh, crop that you're trying to grow, such as a breadfruit. Law enforcement. There is a lot of GIS used in law enforcement. What you're seeing here are maps of the past, but we can also have real-time maps for crime. So you see that's the city of Chicago. That's the Chicago areas where I uh, grew up. And then now you're looking at Tucson, and the areas that are that have warm colors are crime-stricken areas. Homeland Security and, you know, you think of Homeland Security as uh, something just, you know, based off of, uh, you know, external terrorism, but there could be internal terrorism or a natural disaster. And what we're looking at here is Hurricane Irma back in 2017. And when it comes to terrorism, a lot of times maps are used, not just in the United States, but also elsewhere. And this map basically shows the main attacks that have occurred in Europe and Turkey. This was back in 2017. GIS could be used to map wildfires in areas that were recently burned. This is good. These, this is a good map because you can change this very easily in GIS because wildfire coverage changes very rapidly. And then if we get a rain system come in, we can see the areas that might be prone to mudslides. Also, real estate and marketing can use GIS. You may want to, let's say, locate another McDonald's store. Where is there an area that doesn't have a McDonald's and can better serve that population with an added store? In addition, we look at uh, health and human services, like the flu outbreak uh, that we usually deal with every winter. Or the Zika virus, where around the world do we see Zika virus uh, reports? And these reports are changing. And again, in GIS, you can change this very easily, much more easily than you would using a paper map. Another example, I keep going here with examples, uh, urban planning. This is part of uh, Massachusetts and in in, I believe in the Cape Cod. And we're looking at changes in land use between 1951 and 1999. We could also use satellite images in GIS to compare uh, cities or areas that might be changing. And what you're looking at here is the change of the city of Las Vegas from 1972 to 2010. You can imagine, um, just by looking at this, or if you've, even, if you've even been to Vegas, how quickly and how um, steadily this city is growing. So here is a, just a, a, a sneak peek into ArcGIS. ArcGIS is the type of um, GIS software program that we're going to be using in this course, and it also is the industry standard. For example, most employers out there use ArcGIS. So this, these are the streets of Austin, Texas. And again, you can change this really easily in the software, but what makes GIS really powerful too is that there are data tables behind each feature you see on the screen. We'll dive into this a lot more later on in this course, but I just want to mention this right now. This is the power behind GIS. It's, it's, you can change it very easily. It's dynamic, and there are added data through data tables 
in GIS. Careers. So you saw the wide variety of uses. So careers in GIS, I like to think of careers in GIS as lumped into two main categories. You have an existing major or career and you use GIS as a tool or you actually do GIS as a career. So what we're going to be looking at here is the latter of that. Oh, actually, excuse me, it's the former of that, actually. What we're going to be looking at are careers that use GIS as a tool. You see various business uh, sectors using GIS, marketing, real, real estate, and retail. Government, that's where GIS started, was in the government and military. And it's used now for homeland security, fire, emergency, health, and transportation. Natural resources like climatology. I often use GIS for my climate studies. Uh, utilities, when I worked at Southern California Edison, we used uh, GIS quite a bit. And GIS job growth is growing. So now we're looking at the latter, using GIS as a career. This was a few years ago and just gives you an idea of an entry level um, uh, entry level statistics for GIS. Now, many jobs out there require a bachelor's degree, but not all of them. Sometimes they require just a two year degree or even a certificate, which is probably what some of you in this class are trying to obtain. This is a GIS technician uh, example, job posting actually, and this is a full-time position. This is a few years old, but it's a full-time position, and it just requires a minimum of two years of GIS experience or a degree and certificate in GIS, which, is, which you can get both of those here at Pierce College. And down below, you see the GIS Jobs Clearinghouse. That's a really good link to the latest jobs out there. This is what it looks like. This is uh, from last summer. And it just gives you sort of a, uh, I don't know, I don't, you know, look for new jobs. But I kind of like to look at this anyway, just to see what's out there. What, what are the skills that a lot of um, employers are looking for? A lot of them are looking for GIS experience using ArcGIS. And based off of a former coworker I had, they still look for people who can make maps, even though GIS can do way more than just make a map. One other thing you might want to think about is programming. And part of the, the certificate requires, I believe, Python. So programming is also, a, or I should call it computer programming, is also a very valuable skill. So we defined a GIS as geographic information systems. So geographic, we understood that, you know, that's based off of geography. Information, you can think of information as data, usable data, but the systems part kind of throws people sometimes. So a lot of time people think of GIS as just the software, just ArcGIS. But the word systems is in there because it's more than the software. It's the hardware that we use. It's the data, the people behind um, the software, data, and hardware, and the methods that we use, often spatial analysis. So these five pillars here, hardware, software, data, people, and methods, all compose GIS. Now ArcGIS, as we will learn when, we, when we're in the classroom, ArcGIS is the, uh, I'll say 99% of our work will probably be using ArcGIS. And ArcGIS has various levels advanced, standard, and basic. Because you guys will be getting uh, student licenses, I believe you will have, um, you will be able to use the advanced version. And we're using ArcGIS 10.3. 10.3 includes ArcMap, Arc Catalog, and Arc Toolbox. We'll talk much more about that later. Just so you know, 
you are getting the advanced version because it's only used for education. If you are an employer out there you, uh, you know, using GIS, you will have to call or pay a lot more money to uh, to get the advanced version, where the basic version is quite uh, quite cheaper than the advanced version. Okay, and then I want to talk a little bit about the textbook. The well, the textbook is really a workbook, and it's divided in four main four main sections: GIS data and maps. So that talks a little bit about the intro to GIS, what kind of data we deal with, and the maps that we produce. Then it goes into GIS analyst or analysis and with that we kind of deal with some basic uh, spatial analysis and geocoding. Uh, data management, I believe chapter two is where we'll learn a lot more about data management and there are skill references within these books and um, videos for how to do all of the uh, tutorials in this book. So this book has a lot of interesting and a lot of useful um, uh, uh, exercises in general for you to understand not just the, the, you know, the nuts and bolts of the software, but also some of the theory. So each chapter is laid out in three sections. The first part are the concepts. That's where the theory stuff comes into play. Then you do the tutorials, and each tutorial will have a tip or skill tip and videos on how to do that. So that's going to really help you out. The exercises now are loose, they're loose end, and you will not have videos and you will have to really think about it. You have to sometimes go back to what you did in the tutorials to figure out how to do the exercises. And I will assign various exercises as part of the lab component of this course. And I just wanna say, because this is a hybrid course, the concepts which will be covered in lectures are online, and each chapter will have a set of 15 questions that you'll have to answer in the form of an online quiz. Now, the required software, once again, is ArcGIS 10.3. It runs on Windows, but people who have a Mac can buy Parallels, which I believe is, is uh, a way to mirror uh, a Windows operating system on a Mac. If you have a uh, CD-ROM, I will give you I should call it a DVD-ROM. I will give you a DVD with a code, a uh, license code, so that you can get the software for free, I believe for one year. If you do not have a DVD-ROM, you can download the software after I give you a code into, um, uh, you could download the software onto your computer that way, but you will still need the DVD for the code. And it's highly recommended that your personal computer has at least two gigabytes of RAM. Um, I like to think I like to use four just in case. Really for your flash drive. Now there are other types of GIS software out there like Grass and and Geo uh, Media and Map Info, but G ArcGIS falls under the ESRI Environmental Systems Research Institute. We don't even really call it that. We just call it ESRI these days. Now, there's one thing that you could go ahead and get started right now. If you're really curious, you could go to something called ArcGIS Online. And you can actually start creating maps based off of data that's, that's online. It's a cloud-based um, service. And it only helps you kind of get a feel for how to make a map. You can't really, um, it's not really robust. And it, there's not a lot of flexibility like it is when you get into the ArcGIS software. So this is just a couple of things that you can do. And I also wanted to put the, uh, H, uh, the link for ArcGIS online. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in class. Thank you and see you in class.